let you know what we are, what we do. I'm here to tell you how we did it and what we're doing next. Some of the fun things that we're able to do uh, using SAS. You've heard a little bit about what Tableau is and what it can do. SAS is in that same wheelhouse, it's just different. SPSS, SAS, they all have their merits and can do different things. But one thing that we wanted to do and what me and Jeff talked about, Jeff and I talked about, um, was trying to answer those questions of who is out of care, where are they, and can we reach them? We wanted to find out what kind of care we offer as opposed to anyone else in the district. We want to know who is at most risk for contracting and spreading HIV. And then we want to know what areas geographically we should focus our attention. The first thing that we decided to work with is that the state of Georgia HIV surveillance group gives us a list, or doesn't give us a list, just lets us know you have Roughly this, these many people in your district infected with HIV, and we suspect that about 300 or half of them are out of care. And we thought, that seems real high. And we're also not that confident that that high number is accurate. So what we decided to do is do some digging. Um, I pushed and worked with HIV Surveillance Group, and I know some of you may have been in the plenary uh, earlier this morning. Um, a lady that was mentioned by the Fulton County Health Department, Pascal Wortley, um, who has great worked directly with me and under <coughs> some confidentiality and security training, we were able to get a line list of people positive in our district for HIV. That means names, addresses, date of birth, all everything that we need to match people up with our system. So, what we did is we have the state's line list and we have our EMR, which came straight from CareWare. And we found anyone that might be able to match in that area. But what I've got is I've got two data sets, and I have one that I can't touch. It has all the information I need, but I can't clean it. So if there's wrong information in there, there's nothing I can do about it. It's what the state's provided. With our own local EMR, I can clean and do anything I want. And the great part about being sort of a small district and not having population that's Fulton size or Metro Atlanta is that I have the time and ability to go through and comb through each patient and clean data as needed. So that's what we're able to do. So we start off with a total of 678 patients provided to us by the state and find that 145 of those we know about. There's also 69 that the state doesn't know about. That could be because labs are lagging don't get in there, or it could be because we are taking care of people outside of our district. They're coming to us, which are the case sometimes. So what we're left with is 533 of those we know that what the state has provided to me is also includes labs. That 309 of those patients have a lab within the past year, so they're in care. Let's move on. Of the 224, this is where we did something new. We acquired a search engine called LexisNexis. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. And what we did is we searched 224 names in LexisNexis to find out that 11 of them had, had died, 23 or 38 of them had moved out of our district. So they're no longer our responsibility. 80 of them moved out of state. Some were in Utah, some were in California, some moved back to Las Vegas, we got tired of shit. Um, don't blame them. And then we found out that truly, and, and conservatively, so if, if any of you know what LexisNexis is or have looked inside of it, it doesn't always give you an accurate address. Yeah. So if there was any discrepancy, I made sure to keep those people in our 95 list of hour to care, because if there was any way that we might be able to find them, I wanted that to be on our hands and not divvy that out to anyone else as their responsibility. We're trying to find the people that fall through the cracks, not push them off on other people. So conservatively, we have 95 people in our district that are out of care. So after we find all this information, what we do with it? Through the negotiations that I had with the HIV Surveillance Group, I was, it was my responsibility to give back to them, to say, these are the people that have died, these are the people that have moved. And they wanted that information so that they could figure out where in their processes 
they miss them. What we are going to do with our out of care is find them. So now we've developed a RIC protocol, a reengagement in the care, which step by step outlines, much like a disease investigation specialists, how to go about reaching out to people, finding them, making sure that we're talking to the right person, assessing are you in care? You are? Great. That's all we want to know. Would you mind telling us where you're in care? Fantastic. If you're not in care, we would like to offer you services. But are the services that we're offering comparable or better or worse than services they may possibly get elsewhere? So that's what we wanted to do with our Care Cascade project. It started out with the same data set for the 678, but instead of subtracting, we added in our own. We established total unduplicated patient population, and then we had to, to define the cascade or the silos. So what we did, and trying to be as conservative as possible, is that our lengths of care were all newly infected patients that received a viral load or CD4 count lab within 90 days, because that's all we had access to. If they came in for a medical visit, I can't see their encounter if it's by another provider, but I can see their labs. So labs within 90 days, your link to care. Are you retained in care? That's multiple HIV visits or multiple labs drawn within a six month time period. And then are you prescribed medication? The information received from the state did not have anything regarding whether they were on antiretroviral therapy. I can only see that for our clinic. So the only other thing we can establish is the results of a viral load or results of a CD4 and that's viral suppression. And then we split them into providers. So the first two bars in each graph are the same. They're prevalence and prevalence split into provider. And provider being red being the living bridge, green being any other provider in our district, and the gold being all lumped in, out of care, moved, and died. So that 30% of out of care, 95 of them are who we're going to go after and see. But we can tell and see that the care that we can offer is leaps and bounds more beneficial for the patient than what they can go find elsewhere at a private doctor who may not specialize in HIV. So we know who's out of care, we know that we can offer them better services. Now we want to identify and get into a preventative mindset and find the people that don't have HIV and educate and stop and assess who is at highest risk for spreading and contracting each other. So the SENS database, which is the State Electronic Mode Bottle Disease Surveillance System, is new name, <laughs> has all of the morbidity information for syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, captures a little bit of HIV if the person happens to be interviewed. So we take that, I add in careware information, and we come up with a list of people that we can now give to our health departments and our flag for education once they walk through the doors. So truly, this is very accurate information that was pulled, these are real numbers, though for confidentiality purposes, names have been changed, but still may be recognizable. So all of the information that we find goes straight back into action. We're trying to prevent. Now, even the person at the very bottom who happens to have had contracted HIV before, they're going to be educated more on uh, spreading, safe sex, common use, that sort of thing. So, if anyone has ever written a grant or asking for money um, and is in the prevention game, we all know that targeted outreach is a big buzzword, and it is very important that for what you do, you get the biggest bang for your buck. That's what we're all trying to do, is capture the most with the resources that we have. So what I have done is using Careware and using SANS and state HIV information that they've provided, is I create a map of counties, the district, that plot geographic locations down to the address of what disease, has been diagnosed, and I can subset that information through any type of demographic information 
so race, ethnicity, age, sex, um, and just to, to because I, I truly enjoyed doing this, because this was a big culmination of trying to, to make this work. So in detail, what we did, what I did, was I took all the morbidity information, a boundary data set, and then roadmaps. Combined them all together and had to project longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates for every plotted point. So this data set was extremely large. Huge. So when I run this particular code, it takes about a full day to produce <coughs> my, my map. However, I can do it at night and let it run and it's ready for me in the morning. The good thing is we don't have to run this every day. This is a targeted outreach plan of action for the next six months type scenario. So after I project, I have to separate the data set back out into my morbidity, my boundaries, and my roads, and then I can customize them. I can make colors, make symbols, depending on any demographic piece that I wanna, wanna use. And then using SAS, we just lay it down in order, like the greatest pink burger sandwich you've ever seen. <laughs> and this is truly what we get. So in this map for females, I have you know, what you'd see on the outside of the female bathroom. For males, I have what you'd see um, outside the male bathroom, and then colored by disease. I can change that and subset it with minimal adjusting to the code in SAS. So this is very efficient, it's very flexible, and it's very useful. So now targeted testing can be done truly down to the street. And all our outreach has to do is go set up shop on a corner or find a uh, storefront or partner with a local business in the area that wants to be involved in this. And one other caveat on this is our outreach prevention, who is who's new, um, came to you know, I really don't know, you know where these places are, what roads these are. So through SAS, what I'm able to do is I'm able to create, a, this is an HTML file and pin hover text over every road. So if you want to know what road that is, just taking your cursor, will show that this is Riverstone Parkway. So it helps out. So in conclusion, we, with all this, we've answered all the questions that we've set out to do. And that's, you know, who, who's out of care, where are they, can we reach them? We know who and where, and we'll try. That's our next step, is getting those people re-engaged in the care. Are we providing the best possible level of care? Best possible, we're good. We want to get better. 89% viral suppression, I don't think for myself or Jeff or our clinic, is good enough. We're trying to end the epidemic, not slow it. Who's at the highest risk of contracting spreading STDs and HIV? You know exactly who you are. And then, where should we focus our attention in the community? On any given day, month, year, we know exactly by what demographic category you fall into, what STD, what diseases are ailing you based off your geographical location. This is what we set out to do for our district to provide the best care we can for our patients that suffer from HIV or at risk of it. So at this point, I will take any questions you've got. surveillance group, there was a lot of security and confidentiality training that I had to go through. They had to make sure that what hard drive is it going to be on. If you carry it, it's got to be on a flash drive that's got a padlock on it. So um, there were spot checks along the way to get permission. Thank you. We're actually doing something very similar in Columbus Public Health. Uh, we got a we call it our data to care project. And so we have a list from our HIV surveillance at the state level who gave us a line list, just like you. 
Um, and we're, we do a lot of very similar things. I'd actually love to talk to you more about this at another time. Um, but so what we have found is, as we know, people change numbers, people change addresses, and especially if they've been out of care for a while, we can't find them. So we have our out of care list, and we have, as we're investigating, a large percentage of those who are, we don't know they're, um, if they're really in care because we can't find them. But we have just, you know, kind of looking around. We see that they might be on social media. Have you, what are you doing for those that you can't find but you saw that they might be on social media or have you gotten there? So when I was a disease investigation specialist, um, that's one of the things that we did is we created a district Facebook page that was only used for infectious disease and we would actually reach out to patients and it was specifically for um, girls under the age of 18 that had come into the health department because they wanted to get a pregnancy test. They gave fake names, they gave fake phone numbers, wrong addresses, kids, they don't want the parents knowing. So as soon as they get that negative pregnancy test, they're gone. Oh, but you're positive for chlamydia. So we saw about a 30% succession rate, or success rate for, for that. So that's something that we can utilize. We have the ability to use the, the Facebook page to, to track and locate individuals. So we, it's, it's something that we have done. Hi, thanks. Um, looks like some great useful work. Um, uh, my question, though, is around, uh, do you have a planning body and any, um, or planning council, and have you received any pushback from the community in terms of the level, of the types of information or the level of information or the types of activities that, that you're engaged in? Just curious. Haven't received any pushback from community. I don't think, not that we're trying to hide anything, mm -hmm. but I don't think they're aware. I mean, we're just starting to get the clinic opened up, so this is where that is gonna all take place. So once the clinics, once we're back in the, in the building, and we have you know fully staffed clinic and we're ready to go. Those outreach events will start to happen. Um, so far, internally though, we have a great district director who is very forward thinking. And you know, if, if no one's going to be aggressive and try to stop it, how how can we hope to to get a leg up? So so far, no pushback. Hopefully that continues. But every time that we have had questions answered or what you would consider pushback. I have been more than willing to sit down with the you know, state average residents group and Pascal Wortley and say, look, this is what we're going to use it for. You're more than welcome to go along with us every step of the way, and I'll keep you informed as much as I can for buyback. A lot of times, it's, any pushback is met with good, uh, good answer if you're willing to give with your take. We also, as a part of C Grant team, we don't have a formal planning council. Uh, we do have a small group of patients that meet on a quarterly basis. We've shared some of this with them, and the, the comments we've gotten back are, if you're doing things to get more people into this clinic so that they can be treated like we are, go for it. What kind of donor link could you do? Is it a How many people did you use? Sorry, one more time. What kind of data link could you do to produce a combined data set? Data link, so what I, if you're like exporting and importing, <coughs> yeah, I, I took information straight out of Careware, mm -hmm. put it in Excel, and then in the SACs. Oh, because you didn't combine like uh, your section of your, what was it called, SENS data with PJ surveillance data? So SENS is just a data analysis tool. Okay, never mind. Right, okay, so it all comes out from its from the local EMR, CareWare, HIV, any information I get starts out from its originating source. I put it in Excel. I can combine it there or not. I generally edit fields and then when I merge and combine anything, it's really done in SAS because SAS is so, if you know the code, which is a code base, and if you know how to utilize it, it's so easy. Thank you for this great presentation. I have a simple question. From the out of care list, do you know, like, do you see patients out of care for more than a long time, like five years, 10 years? You yes, do see. Yes, ma'am. Th those are the ones that, me personally, we haven't started it, but me personally, I don't, I, I, 
feel that we're going to find that they have either moved or have passed away or had some name discrepancy. Because that's what I find a lot is someone was under a different name. They were a junior or that they get put on a death record. Something happened to where HIV surveillance who housed information just didn't pick up that specific individual. Yeah, um, question that caught my ear early on, really specific. I think you said your definition of retained in the care was multiple. Um, medical visits within six months. So that means that anyone that only had that had one during six months wouldn't be in your retained in care, right? Because because we 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 went through and siloed those with in six months. So if it was the patient would have had to have multiple visits within a certain time frame. And, um, if it was six months, I can't remember what. Exactly how we, because that was this is a pro, this is the beginning project that we that we started on. Usually, I think I see you know retained in care defined as at least one visit in six months. So if you're saying multiple in six months, that's it, yeah. I think one of the reasons we had to go to the memory service is this is all up in the line list, and so we didn't have. I mean, for our our internal stuff, we could do that whole one visit in six months no problem. Mm -hmm. But for the the stuff that you got from the state. Just to be absolutely sure they were retained, we wanted to see two within six mm -hmm. because it's just a it's just a lab result. Mm -hmm. It's not a doctor's visit or anything like that. So we just had to go with something that was something certain. Okay. So they had the control on what we could do with that that day. Right. So we, we for our purpose, we, we didn't want to just boost numbers to get fluff. We wanted to say you know have a strict limit of substance for what we defined as when to attain and by the suppress and the heart. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so you mentioned that you partnered with uh, your state surveillance to get some data on a group of people that was presumed to be out of care. Then you were able to pare that down pretty well. Um, did you um, get to learn some of the reasons why that data wasn't flowing to surveillance? I work on the surveillance side in North Carolina. And I'm just interested in that. Um. <laughs> The, uh, I would say that the reason that we didn't, because we, we always report up. Mm -hmm. Information always flows up the ladder. But to me, it just felt sort of out of place for it not to go both ways. So when I talked to them, one of the reasons that they said, or one of the reasons that I heard that they gave information back to us was because no one had really asked, and maybe no one had really asked as many times or in the way that I had. Because um, it was, you know, when you're, when you're given a position and saying you're charged with data analysis, you're going to have data to work with. So, sort of my job security. <laughs> okay, I think we have okay. three more minutes left. Oh, I'd like to ask a question. Sure. So, um, I work in California, and we had, we when we did our data to care project, one of the big things that we used it for was to help clean up the state's EHAR's surveillance system so we kind of have the same experience um, where we had more current information than what the state had. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, Orange County is really close to LA and San Diego, which are huge counties. Like, we're all just really big, populous counties, so people move across the borders quite often. So LA doesn't use the same system that the rest of the state does. Um, so some of it was that if somebody had labs, labs somewhere else, the information wasn't updated into the state EHAR system. Um, and then we also only just got access to um, add new information to EHARS ourselves in the last three months. Um, and that's helped a lot with keeping our Orange County EHARS data up to date. Um, but I think that it's, from what I understand and talking to our state surveillance people, it's a, primarily a staffing issue. They don't have the staff to upkeep um, the updated information in EHARS on an ongoing basis. I will say the HIV surveillance group in Atlanta is made up of five people. 